Joan Donovan is an author, professor, and researcher specializing in the study of disinformation. Donovan's work has appeared in outlets like BuzzFeed News, Slate Magazine, and Wired. She is also a co-author of the 2022 book Meme Wars, the untold story of the online battles upending democracy in America. In 2018, Donovan began to lead the Technology and Social Change Research Project at Harvard University. In 2020, she became director of the Kennedy School's Shorenstein Center on Media, Politics, and Public Policy. Donovan left Harvard in 2023, alleging that the involvement of Facebook influenced the university's decision to end her research. Hello and welcome to the Art of the Interview. I'm Brian Foisey, along with James Buxer, and we are happy to be joined by Joan Donovan. She's one of the foremost experts of disinformation, and she's traveled to some of the darkest corners of the internet so that we don't have to. Professor Donovan, welcome. Thanks for having me. First, what's your history with Boston University? <laughs> I've been here a few times in my life. Uh, I didn't get, I, I got in as an undergrad, but I didn't end up coming here. Um, but many years ago, I've, I booked a punk rock concert at the library, at Mugar Library, um, for this band that's still around. They're called Against Me, but I think this was about 20 years ago. And, and I don't think the librarians really knew what we were doing. And uh, so it was just like, you know, 150 rowdy punk rockers and stacks of books, you know, and, and people were just in there playing loud music and having fun. And I, I remember at the end of the night, it was, thanks for coming, don't come back. Donovan is back at Boston University. As an assistant professor of journalism and emerging media studies, where she continues to research disinformation and educate a new generation of journalists. How would you encapsulate what disinformation means to you? Telling lies on purpose, mm -hmm. usually to serve a political end. And the reason why it flourishes online is because we don't have the same gatekeepers, the same kind of fact checking for journalism, the same kind of editorial that would go into shaping uh, and telling a, a true story. The last few years of my research has been looking at how disinformation mobilizes, how it gets people to go out and do something mm -hmm. about this, you know, atrocity that they think that they're witnessing. Mm -hmm. And uh, what is an example of disinformation that's circulating on the internet today? The thing is, is they're often very banal, um, and they often have some interrelationship with breaking news. And so one of the things that I've been looking at are these AI-generated photos of war. And there are some that are particularly very strange because they're children in Gaza in the rubble um, holding on to cats. And it's just like really like a kind of sentimental in a way. Uh, you see the innocence of the children, the innocence of the animal. There's no blood. There's no gore. Um, but it just strikes me as something that's much more propagandistic and is, is meant to uh, make you feel a certain way about the information that you're taking in. Where, what's the source of these kind of things? That's uh, the challenge here is because the way in which social media is designed, you can be fairly anonymous to the rest of the world, but you can't be anonymous to the tech companies. But it can be a range of people from state actors to um, teenagers to uh, political operatives to angry uncles, you know, it, it really runs the gamut. And one of the things that we've yet to reckon with as a society is just, just what happens when you give high definition broadcast in the form of a telephone to every single person that can afford it. Mm -hmm. how, how do you catch that fake image like you're talking about? Yeah, so uh, there's a few things you can do. Reverse image search is usually a good place to start. The other thing we run into a lot is what we call recontextualized media. Mm -hmm. So that's essentially a clip or an image taken from some other time and then is repackaged to make it seem like it happened just now. What mental toll does seeing so much of the Internet's darkest corners take on you? I don't know. I mean, I'm, pr I'm still a pretty stable genius, you know. And humble. And humble, 
Of course, no. <laughs> Come on, we're talking about memes. Um, you know, I, uh, I, I do this work usually in the context of a team. Um, so we know what we're looking for and we know how to find it. There are times where you get shocked. You see something and you're like, oh my God, I, you know, I'm, I don't, you know, like, I don't have eye wash. Like, I, I can't <laughs> get this out of my head. So w oftentimes the most rewarding part of my research isn't my research, but is the things that people can do with my research in the world. You have a team of researchers. You guys are accustomed to seeing these sorts of things, but a lot of users aren't. And mm -hmm. I, I found an interesting report. It's from Morning Consult, and I just want to read from it to be a accurate here. It says about half of Generation Alphas, which is children under 10, are streaming video content daily, and by age eight, they're on social media for up to three hours a day, and that's according to their parents. That sounds like disinformation, uh, <laughs> but w what do you make of something like that? Uh, I completely believe it, and here's why, is that there was an assumption at the beginning of the pandemic that children you know, we're going to use the laptop and the iPad to go to preschool and, you know, K through 12. And then there was this idea as if the pandemic was subsiding or we were going back outside that kids would go touch grass and that would be it. But it's not true. They're staying online. The business model of social media is to get them as young as possible so that, uh, uh, Gen Alpha or even Gen Z experience a kind of infrastructure lock. If we are going to face the reality that children are using uh, these apps, then we need real child protections on them. Um, because otherwise, another shocking statistic comes from a meta whistleblower, um, someone who had been working at Instagram for many years, um, Toro Behar. He said that they did a very short survey of Instagram users. Um, it was only about a week long, but what we know is that these social media platforms are not neutral. They do become these conduits that do bring strangers into the lives of adults and now also the lives of children. On the topic of whistleblowing and social media companies, uh, what is the current status of a, a potential lawsuit with Harvard? So we have not gone into a lawsuit with Harvard yet. For me, like, the fight is about my intellectual property. Harvard has claimed that they own everything I did while I was at Harvard, even if I was getting paid by s some other entity like my book publisher to publish my book. Um, so I want my intellectual property back so I can continue the work that I was doing. And then I want the funding back that I raised. I estimate that uh, I left about $3 million at Harvard, um, but it's no small feat to bring a, a corporation like Harvard to a lawsuit. So I'm really trying to work as much as we can to get some kind of remediation. Um, the other thing that's been interesting since coming out as a whistleblower is that I've learned a lot about Meta's behavior, about Harvard's behavior, about the relationships between people at Meta. Like what? What are, what are some of the things that you've learned? Well, okay, so when I was doing my research um, building my whistleblower complaint, I was looking at um, stuff about Sheryl Sandberg and where she went to school, and, and I happened upon a People magazine spread of her wedding. And, and Sheryl Sandberg is the COO? C oh, of she's the former COO of Facebook. Okay. She used to go to Harvard. She graduated from the Harvard Kennedy School. I found out that my dean was uh, her undergraduate advisor, but I found this wedding picture of him at her wedding four days before he came and told me he was shutting my lab down. And you believe that things like uh, being the undergraduate advisor or being at a wedding, you think these things are connected to your dismissal from Harvard? There's very little you can do um, at Harvard to get pushed out in the way that I did. But one of the things is to take aim at how they make their money. The way in which I ended up becoming targeted by Meta 
um, began in October of 2021 when Francis Haugen had sent a trove of meta documents and research to Congress. What the Haugen disclosure showed is that Meta was very aware that their products were harming people and they didn't do anything about it. Just like if we had a scandal where a pharmaceutical company knew that their products were harming people um, and they just ignored it. So when I get those documents though, I get the raw documents. The mm -hmm. only other people in the world that have the raw documents are a few journalists and Congress and then there's me who gets them. And I have them and I say to myself, uh, I remember very clearly saying, okay, this is, this is it for me. Like I'm gonna have to put these out into the world because nobody else is gonna be able to risk it. And Why I'm did you feel like you had to, had to put them out? I, don't, I just don't think I could have like, lived with myself if I knew internationally the harm this company was causing and that I was sitting on evidence of that. Congress relies on people like me to help them understand the stuff that they're uh, trying to regulate. It's not courage, it's not, it's not that, but I just felt like you're an academic, like your job is to work with the truth. If you were to remake the internet, uh, what would you change? It would just be one website, It'd be a picture of my cats, and then anybody who went there sent me a dollar. <laughs> <laughs> but in, in seriousness, uh, what would you do differently? I'm completely serious. <laughs> you know, there are a lot of things that we could advance about the internet that we haven't really even thought about because we don't think about it like a public works project. My hope is that people of my generation can get their shit together and at least try to reform some of the system. And then my hope for younger generations is that they just get tired of it. You know, um, this is the first generation, Gen Alpha is the, well, maybe even Gen Z is the first generation that is asked pretty much from birth to be content consumers and producers. And that, that is so tiring, you know, and people should be able to live a life IRL and not have a digital footprint. But right now, Facebook will make fake profiles of people if they don't have a Facebook profile. I mean, it's, it's really that big and odorous and, and inflexible. And so I do think that we need to have some antitrust regulation that would at least um, open up some competition in the space. Now, this has all been pretty heavy. But really? Yeah. Um, how does a person like you, who is a fan of punk rock, big sports fan, and a cat lover, end up becoming the leading expert on disinformation? Shenanigans. shenanigans. What do you mean by shenanigans? <laughs> well, like, I'm not going to say I don't work hard, because I do. I work every day of my life. I don't take, I had no days off. Um, like Bill me, Belichick. Me and Belichick, yeah. right? No days off. You have a choice in life about how you're going to live it. And I, my experience has been listen to advice, but follow your heart. If you surround yourself with really smart people that are driven on the same mission that you are and you treat them with respect and they treat you with respect, even when you're studying things that are awful, you feel like you're in it with somebody else. And now, you know, I'm thinking about, I'm at BU, what kind of trouble can I get into in a good way, not in a malicious way? <laughs> um, you know, how do we use the institution so that it benefits not just people who pay to go here, but the broader community? But I've noticed that the people who still do good work and are happiest in their 40s and 50s are the people who have followed their passion and have taken their lumps along the way, but uh, have never really given up on that idealism of youth. And who would ask you to? Some more <laughs> hopeful sentiment to leave our interview on. Uh, we can't wait to see what kind of trouble you get into. 
That's going to be all the time we have for today. Dr. Donovan, thank you so much for being here. I'm James Buxer with Brian Foisey. On behalf of the entire Art of the Interview team, thank you so much for watching. Take care.